welcome to the first ever Campfire Sessions presented by NCAMP. I'm Luke Jacobs, the host, and we are joined today by Tony DeMarco from BCA. We're excited to get started to talk about today's topic, ISO 14001. But before we do that, Tony, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your company? Yeah, thanks, Jacob. Again, appreciate the opportunity. Anyone on here, if we hear some noise upstairs, it's my daughter's fifth birthday, so hopefully we don't get Understood. too much noise. Understood. But, um, as far as uh, my background in BCA, so I've been with the company for 10 years. Um, I'm vice president of consulting services based out of South Bend. So we have South Bend, Indianapolis, and a Louisville location. And actually, we just opened up a Puerto Rico location uh, end of 2019. Oh, wow. So um, BCA and a whole were a, um, you know, a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sorry. <laughs> uh, full service? Full spectrum, <laughs> you know, full service, full spectrum environmental uh, compliance company. So we're working with Brownfield and remediation out of our Indianapolis office. But mm -hmm. as far as what's pertinent today is out of my office. Um, we're working mostly with manufacturing and industrial facilities with their compliance, whether it's wastewater, rec for air, your basic compliance stuff with permitting with the state and government. And then we're working with things like this, ISO 14001, 45001. When you're looking at compliance, we're really looking at like the management, how you're managing your environmental concerns at your company. Um, and then off of that, we also have a lot of training where we do compliance training, ISO training. Those are kind of our three buckets out of the South Bend office with our manufacturing clients. Got it. Great, great. Yeah. So after our initial conversation, I was, you know, interested. You're clearly an expert on, you know, ISO, especially how it, uh, you know, really, you know, is pertinent to environmental programs. Um, but I would just love to hear a little bit more about, you know, what ISO standards are, you know, customers generally calling you most about, and really just why is ISO important? Kind of what's the the highlights of ISO as a whole? Mm -hmm. Yeah. ISO in general, so for people that um, are kind of new to this, ISO stands for International Standards Organization. So that's the umbrella organization for all standards. Today we're talking about 14,001, which is environmental specific, but they have 9,001, which is for quality. That's kind of the, that's the main one. That was the, one of the original ones in the 80s, and that's what everything's kind of branched off of. There's a safety one. There's one for aerospace. There's one for medical equipment. There's a food grade one. They go across all spectrums of industry on specific standards that ISO puts out on how to manage your concerns. So if you're in the food industry and you have equipment that is um, processing food related material, how are you keeping that clean? What procedures internally do you have to make sure that's happening? So same concept applies on the uh, environmental side. So the organization came up with you know, 10 sections on how to set yourself up. And the standards are written vaguely, similar mm -hmm. to regulations, if you're familiar, as people are familiar with regulations. Um, some regulations are very specific. Some safety, especially, are very broad. So ISO is kind of that way. Everything's very broad because everything is just a template and guidance for you to set your own system up. So it's up to you as the company, as the person implementing an ISO program, to come up with what are the specifics to my company and then use the ISO program to set myself up and make sure that I have a system in place at my company so I know where my records are. I know where my procedures are. I know that this procedure is this person's duty to make sure that the um, bag house operates correctly so you're not emitting emissions into the air and violating your air permit. So it's how you set yourself up how do you designate certain people to do certain things to make sure your goals of your program are reached? Got it. Got it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, what are some of the benefits and reasons for a company to become ISO, you know, certified in general and then really specific to our audience, you know, ISO 14001? What are some of the biggest benefits you get from putting in that work to get a system like that in place? Mm hmm. So I'll answer both questions in there. I'll start with uh, reasons. We have reasons and benefits. Reasons are, for some people, can be very simple. If you are a tier one supplier to Ford, GM, any sort of motor company, they are going to require you to be certified. They're going to be, require you to be 14,001 certified. They will require you to be 9,001 certified. And then if you're in the auto industry, you have a certain standard called IATF, which is another sort of 
management system specific to auto suppliers in the auto industry. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. if your biggest comp if Ford is asking you to do it, you're going to do it. So that's amazing. Absolutely. Um, yep. Yeah, there's there's that reason. And that'll change over time too. That'll kind of go down the pipeline. Um, you know, it's mainly tier one and tier two suppliers. And in time, will they ask tier three suppliers? Um, now, two years ago, ISO 45001 came out, which is safety. Now, mm-hmm. BMW, Nissan, Toyota, those companies may be the first ones to require the safety one. Then mm-hmm. for GM, they may be the next down the line. So if your suppliers are asking for it, that's a big reason. Now, mm-hmm. reason and benefits combined, let's look at reason and benefits, whether benefits from if you are required to have it from a supplier, you do get these benefits. Now, if you're someone that's maybe just evaluating, um, I've had some environmental issues in the past. Maybe our company has grown a little bit and we ran environmental out of human resources or some other department. We don't have an environmental person, um, but now we're kind of growing to a point where maybe we need to structure ourselves better. So the benefits are really just the structure. That's kind of, that gets you to all the other benefits. The main benefit is you now know what your areas of concern are because that's one requirement the requirement Mm -hmm. is to say what are your significant impacts and aspects so that means you go out into your plant you walk your facility you talk to all the people that have been there the longest figure out they know the equipment they know of maybe a spill that happened six years ago because some obscure thing happened or Mm -hmm. maybe it was um, six years ago they didn't have a certain procedure in place for doing X, Y, and Z. And six years ago, Mm -hmm. it changed it. Now they don't have any spills anymore. So how do you get that information that has been kind of carried over the years and never maybe written down in a procedure, maybe never documented, maybe never formalized? It was, you know, your your maintenance tech, your maintenance leader that came up with this new procedure. So this thing didn't leak anymore. Now, when they gone, when they're gone, maybe they retire, they leave, um, they are on medical leave. What happens to that information now that they're gone to make sure that that procedure that mm-hmm. stopped this thing from spilling is still in, in intact, intact. So you more memorializing things, formalizing all your processes. So you reap all those benefits in the end. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it sounds like generally just you set it up so you're not reinventing the wheel every time uh, you need to do exactly. anything related to your compliance. Yeah. Exactly. So, and there's a whole, not section, there's a whole section kind of on the safety side. And they started putting it more in the ISO 14001. So let me kind of mm-hmm. actually, if I can talk about that, kind of take a step back. Absolutely. Absolutely. 14001 is kind of, it's been through multiple iterations. It started in the 90s. Mm-hmm. That's when Ford and GM, everyone, I think it was 1998. Then they came out with a new version in 2004. And they add some more pieces to that. So that had more requirements than the 1998. Then mm-hmm. Um, 2004, then I believe is 2008, they did a minor revision or 2009. Then 2015, they really kind of revamped the whole thing and mm-hmm. they made it so 14, 9,000 and 45,001 all align. So there, like I said mm-hmm. there were 10 sections. You know, one section is find where your environmental and health concerns are. Find out, um, what your objectives are. So there's a step for each one of those. Mm-hmm. Um, so in 2015, they started adding more information on management of change. And that's a big deal. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. people leave, changes in equipment, changes in a supplier, um, changes in uh, a coding material that you use if, if you're a coding manufacturer. So going back to the point, if if someone leaves, that's a change. If there's a new piece of equipment, mm-hmm. that's a change. So you would have a certain process that says when there's a personnel change, we need to look at the procedures that are associated with that person. And if they're gone, how do we reassign those? Or Mm -hmm. if we're looking at buying a piece of equipment, okay, we need to have environmental look at that. We need to have health and safety look at that. What are the health and safety concerns? What are the environmental concerns? Does this need to be permitted before we can even bring it on site? Does Mm -hmm. it need to be permitted before we use it? Um, Maybe there's no air permitting or water permitting concerns, but is there a certain hazardous waste associated with this that we now need to get set up to transport hazardous waste? We need to get set up with a 
hazardous waste ID number. We need to now know that we report. So it's getting ahead of the game. So if you have these processes in place on how to evaluate changes and evaluate what you're, how you're currently operating, you can make a better guess on what the future may be and put plans in place now mm-hmm. to avoid any issues or problems later. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Just, uh, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Plan, plan early. Yeah. Yeah, so, exactly. Uh, so, yeah, that sounds like, uh, you know, the benefits seem pretty clear, you know, outside of maybe if, uh, you know, some of your clients or uh, different companies you work with need it, as well as just generally putting together, you know, your plans ahead of time, getting some good continuity. Um, but so what does a company actually need to get started? If I'm starting from, you know, square one, I don't have ISO, how would I go about starting my ISO, say, 14,001 certification, 9,001? Uh, you know, what are kind of the nuts and bolts of getting this, you know, off the ground? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. First and foremost, it depends on every, every client's different. That's, that's yep. like, again, going back to this thing was written um, kind of vaguely and it's a standard. So it's written mm-hmm. that way. So you build off of. So I'll kind of answer that in a couple different ways. Yeah. So let's say let's say you're a a larger company. I say large as in maybe 500 people working there. Okay. Um, so larger on the medium size, medium to large. Now let's say you already have a, an air permit and you already have a wastewater permit and you already have hazardous waste. It's likely you already have some sort of procedures in place. Mm-hmm. You already know if you have an air permit, you're kind of forced in a way to have these procedures and have these certain standards for yourself on what information do I need to track. If I'm a painting operation, I have to track how much paint I'm using each mm-hmm. day and each month, um, which means you calculate your VOCs and your HAPs. Same with hazardous waste. You might already be tracking it. So you may already have a lot of that information. Because mm-hmm. when you look at setting up, whether you're this company that may already have an air permit or you're a company that doesn't have a lot of environmental concerns, so maybe you don't have an environmental person, but maybe you have enough where it's still kind of confusing. And mm-hmm. whether you're being management has decided to be 14,001 or suppliers asking to be 14,001, the area you start with is um, this part in the standard of significant impacts and aspects. Mm -hmm. Essentially, you're looking at what processes and equipment do I have and waste and everything else? What do I have that creates a potential impact on the environment? So what is Mm -hmm. putting a pollutant into the air? What is putting a pollutant into a water that is then running off as stormwater or is running to the your local POTW, the city wastewater department mm-hmm. through the sewer system. So where where are my environmental concerns? I'm taking a product, I'm reshaping it, I'm forming it, I'm doing something to it to make a new product. Within that box in between of raw material and finished product, there are waste into the air, possibly into the water, or going off to the landfill or going off as hazardous waste. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's where you start, getting organized. What do I have? Mm-hmm. And what environmental impacts am I possibly creating into the air, the water, to the land? So that's where you start, just yeah. getting organized. What do I have? And then from there, it can go in a number of different re- directions. Then from there, you're building out, okay, these three areas are my significant areas. So I want to focus on those three areas. So that's what the standard asks you to do. Find out what you have in total. Mm-hmm. and then. We call it, so it's a management system. Mm -hmm. You can't manage anything and everything. We both have businesses and we try to manage as much as we possibly can, but you have to put in procedures to kind of make sure that different things are managed by different people or different software or different processes. So how am I going to manage this overall problem? And some areas aren't as bad as others. So if you have some piece of equipment that generates some pollutant into the air, but you have a, a a control device, a well-functioning new control device, and you maybe use it a little bit, so you don't use it up that often. 
likelihood, you could say that's not significant. So I'm not going to focus as many of my resources on controlling the environmental pollutants coming from that processor piece of equipment because we have these three over here that have had deviations with the permit or there was a spill in this area two years ago. So we have evidence that they have issues. So let's make those our significant areas and let's focus on cleaning those up. And then you clean those up, you reduce their significance. Maybe something else is significant. So you're always moving that target to say, right now, this is what we think is significant. We clean it up and we get better. Now we lower our threshold to continue continuous improvement. Always looking mm-hmm. to improve and drop that bar down a little bit, little bit by little bit until you can get as far as you can go. I mean, you can only go so far. Let's take the example of a, a coating process. If your supplier is supplying you the paint and the customer is asking for quality, um, it, from a quality standpoint, it has to be this paint that you're coating our product with. And that has, you know, 60% volatile organic compounds. You mm-hmm. can't set a goal to take it to 50% because your supplier won't allow that and, or your customer won't allow that. Maybe your supplier can't supply a coating mm-hmm. at 50% that meets the quality. So all these things get tied into in together you know mm-hmm. a real system if you're setting it up a really good system i should say real system a good system would have a quality component environmental component safety component and if you're doing you know management of change there's no sense mm-hmm. to have a management of change for environmental one for safety one for quality you just do it all together and you combine all that together and you operate with one mindset for safety environmental and quality all at the same time yeah, yeah, that makes a ton of sense, kind of this integrated view of your programs. Um, so in general, with these different ISO certifications, you know, let's say I'm a, you know, I'm a company owner, I'm looking to get ISO certified. Do I need to do these in a certain order? Like if I want ISO 14001, do I need to get my 9001 first? Or mm-hmm. how does that work? Mm-hmm. Um. Right now, so in 2015 and 2018, like I said, they, they changed the standards for all three of those, the health and safety, the quality, and the environmental. So now they all match up. So in a way, no, it doesn't matter. It doesn't gotcha. matter which one you start with. I would say if you're going to put a 14,001 program, my guess is you probably have a quality program. Whether it's a 9001 quality program, every manufacturing company has some sort of quality program. Mm-hmm. So I've always kind of, I've always kind of asked for that group to be involved. Cause let's say you're a company and you don't have an environmental department. So you're running your environmental out of human resources, which is pretty common, or you're running it out of maintenance. Mm-hmm. Those departments may not necessarily have a background with a management system. Mm-hmm. Where if you're in quality, that's just part of quality is you're managing quality and you're trying to find defects and you're trying to find what are the significant problem areas in our process. So whether you're 9001 certified or not, if your people in your quality department kind of already have that mindset. So it's good if you can have kind of those people to help get it started. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I don't mean you necessarily have to have a 9001 to get it started. It's just that's the oldest of the programs, and I, I I see even if a company doesn't have a quality program, it just seems like those 9001 principles are kind of integrated into normal business now because it's been around mm-hmm. for 30, 40 years. So if you can kind of start with that, let's see, see what kind of quality procedures you have, see how kind of your quality system is set up, whether it's certified or not, mm-hmm. and try to see if that makes sense to start with. Um, I always try to start with what you already have rather than, like we said earlier, create, constantly creating new. Um, mm-hmm. Start with you, what you have. Maybe you have to modify what you have a little bit in your quality and then branch out from there. But, but they're made to where if you, you can start with any of them, mm-hmm. and since they all line up, at any point you can basically kind of add on. So that's what yeah. we're doing right now. Yeah. We, have a, we have a company we're working with where they have a nine. Now we're integrating the not 14 into the nine. By doing that, we pretty much have everything for the safety. So now you just bolt on a couple things safety specific, and now you have three certifiable programs. Yeah, that's really interesting. 
Um, and so when you say certifiable program, what's really the, the difference between if I'm following all these ISO procedures, how do I actually make that, I guess, official? Do I need to go through another certification process? Uh, would that be working with mm -hmm. someone like you? How does that work? Right. Not with us. I have stayed away from the certification body standpoint. You know, our mm -hmm. primary role is from the consulting and guidance. Uh, we have experience across industries for kind of seeing how different people do that. So from our standpoint, we are consulting on implementation and we do a lot of internal auditing for people. Um, mm -hmm. So from the certification side, there are many certification bodies. There's Smithers. Um, certification body, which is out of Akron, Ohio. There's Bureau Veritas, which is all over the world. There's um, ABS, which is all over the world and based out of Texas. There's all these other ones too around the Midwest and all over mm -hmm. the United States, um, large mm -hmm. and small certification bodies. So you have to bring out an external certification body and a set mm -hmm. of auditors. Number of auditors depends on how big your company is, um, both in people, operation, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you know, like footprint. Um, so they have to come in and I'll, let's look at it as if you do not have a 14,000 one. Let's say you don't have a program at all. This is your first time you set it up. They come in and they do kind of a, an initial assessment, which is part of the certification audit, but won't necessarily be used. That first visit is not used to determine whether or not you're good to go to have your certification or not. It's a, mm -hmm. a blanking on the exact name, but it's kind of an initial assessment by the certification body to see where are your records, how are you set up, are you on the right track? They can kind of give you some guidance on, okay, this would be a major nonconformance, this would be a minor nonconformance, here's what you know to clean up before we come back. So mm -hmm. they come back in about six weeks, eight weeks, um, and then they actually do the certification audit. So this is, act this is after you've already done your internal auditing, you've set yourself up, you've done your management review. These are all just kind of components mm -hmm. of the standard I'm naming off. And then they come in and they may spend only a day or two. But if you're a larger facility, they may have three or four auditors there for five days. Mm -hmm. So then they're there for that entire time. They're auditing. They're looking at all your paperwork. They're interviewing personnel, um, both on the plant floor and management. Um, they may want to contact a contractor to see, let's say you have contractors on site. They may want to talk to contractors to see how you're handling that because there's a whole section on how do you handle outsource processes? How do you handle contractors mm -hmm. and make sure that they're disposing of waste correctly? So they can come in and kind of look wherever. Um, it's similar to if you have an agency inspection out of OSHA or IDEM where if they ask for something, you have to show it and let them go through it and find out where you're conforming with the standard and where you're not conforming with the standard. Mm -hmm. If you have a, and then if you have a nonconformance, so you're missing a piece or you didn't do something in full, that doesn't mean you won't get your certification. So they take that back, they write a report, then they give you an allotted amount of time to fix those nonconformances, send them objective evidence on how and what you did and where you're at now on that nonconformance. Then they will say, no, that's not good enough. You need to do more or most likely, they will say, okay, that's good. We can remove that and move on and give you your certification. Now, if you have multiple major nonconformances, you won't get the certification. Maybe you can have one major nonconformance, and but then you fix it in a timely manner, and then you can still get your certification. After that, then kind of looking at, okay, you have your certification now. You've gone through that initial assessment. You fix the things in the initial assessment. You had your certification audit. Um, they provide the audit report, you fix your nonconformances, and then now you have this year-long period before they come back. So mm -hmm. your certification mm -hmm. runs for three years. So if you got your ISO certification now, you'd have that until April of 2023. So you have certi certification audits every three years, and in between you have what's called a surveillance audit. So okay. those auditors will come back. Let's say during your certification audit, it required three auditors, maybe only one or two come back during the surveillance audit. It's shorter. It's less intense. They won't look at everything each time. So over that kind of two-year window in between the certification audit, they'll try to catch as much as they can. But then during the certification audit is actually really where your 
renewing your certification or you could kind of think it of I got to renew my permit if you have an air permit or wastewater permit. You know, you have to renew it every five years. So kind of view it as a renewal where those mm-hmm. middle years are kind of you're reporting or kind of like a, a certification that you're still in conformance and you're still acting under your current certification as you're supposed to. Got it. Yeah, yeah. That makes a ton of sense. So, you know, this whole process, I know for a lot of people listening, you know, cost is always a really important factor, uh, you know, with any sort of decision. So, you know, can you walk me through a little bit of, you know, what costs are involved in creating your ISO program and then the certification and maintenance of that? And then also what factors might, you know, change how much that, you know, could cost, I would imagine, you know, depending on how big you are, you know, kind of the complexity that you have as an organization, but then potentially who you work with as well on either end, I guess, just, uh, you know, walk me through yep. how you could budget that out. Okay. Let me start at the very end, at, just yeah. since we were talking about the certification audit. So at the end of it, you know, there's costs all from there to set it up. But at the end, your cost is going to be based on, like you said, how big you are. Because mm-hmm. the cost of the certification audit and your certification stamp and flag is dictated on how many days and how many auditors that the certification body has to send you. So mm-hmm. let's say the certification body says we need to be there for three days and we need to send two auditors. You can basically say, okay, two auditors, let's say 80 to $90 per hour at two, at three days so 16 hours per day in total so you're looking at uh, eight maybe 1500 to 1600 per day so that mm-hmm. audit certification could be in the range of 3500 to 4000 dollars. kind of spitballing some numbers based on scenarios yeah, but that could change mm-hmm. i mean if you're really small and it's only one day one auditor maybe it's only you know 1500 dollars. but then there's also the travel and the food of the auditors coming in and all that type of stuff so Depends on how big you are and how many auditors and how many days that they need to be there. Mm-hmm. Now, as far as costs are setting up, kind of looking at that two ways, I guess it kind of depends on how we define costs too. So there's the mm-hmm. cost of, let's say you hire a consultant to come in and help you set it up. There's that cost, which depending on how big you are, that whole process of implementation if you really go through it and like you just have like someone on site dedicated to get it done and you're a, a reasonably sized company with a a Title V permit and a wastewater permit and you generate hazardous waste, mm-hmm. if you really, really push through it, maybe six to eight months, six months you could. Mm-hmm. Realistically, it's going to take over a year to get it started, to get the action plan put together, to identify your significant aspects to implement procedures, to implement the procedures from getting them started and then also letting them run for a little bit to see, is this procedure good enough? Yeah. So you kind of want to test your system out before you even have it certified because you may want to make tweaks along the way because you figured out, oh, this didn't really work because we did an internal audit or we did um, something failed. Um, mm-hmm. So you don't mm-hmm. want to just like ramp in there at six months, put all your procedures together, and then have someone come in when you really haven't let the system kind of work itself out for another six months and find other problems are going to arise because they're going to arise. It always are going to arise when you start Definitely. something like this. Um, so you want to work through those. So to break that down to like kind of when we're looking at costs, there's the cost of if you have a someone coming in, you hire someone to do that. And then there's the cost of just if you have it out of your HR office, what's the cost of your HR people not doing HR while they're trying right. to implement this? And then what's the cost, cost of, yeah, so there's just looking at all those different things and, and just depending on what, what type of company you are, what you make, the type of environmental impacts you have, that could go in a number of different ways, but I'd say a year. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A year to year and a half to get it started, go through the whole process. So, whatever your cost of a year to year and a half of opportunity cost or cost to have someone help you, that's kind of how you can look at it. Is look at kind of a year long process. And then there's going to be an- ancillary costs. Um, there's a whole corrective action program. 
So, mm. which means while you're doing your audits or if a spill happens, you enter that into your corrective action system, which means you have to find a root cause of that. So maybe some people are familiar with like the five whys. I think that's, I can't remember that's safety or quality. Um, mm-hmm. There's all these different diagrams that you can do root cause analysis for. So do you have to buy software to have a corrective action program? Maybe quality already has that software. So then you're just mm-hmm. going to bolt on to their own software. Maybe environmental and quality and, and don't work well together. So they don't want you to use their software. So you have to get your own software. Um, mm-hmm. Every company has their own culture on kind of how different departments work together. So there's a the software side of it. If you need it, there's the, um, do we need new controls? Um, maybe we find somewhere that we need more secondary containment. So we need to add a concrete berm to something. So there's that type of actual construction cost that could come out of mm-hmm. this because you, mm-hmm your facility differently and now you have a better understanding of where your problems could be um then there's the opportunity cost then there's the real dollar cost of outside help and the certification at the at the very end yeah yeah that's really helpful and it was so, general, uh, i was trying to kind of give an idea of what it looks like but i wish i could put some real dollars on it for people to kind of know but it just depends it totally depends on how big absolutely you are, what you have Yep. Every company is unique and it sounds like every program then, you know, will be unique as well with their, Mm -hmm. their setup. Yeah. So, uh, Mm -hmm. Tony, this has been, uh, you know, really helpful. And I know BCA, uh, your company can offer great information and services about ISO standards, certifications, really this whole process. You're clearly an expert. Uh, So how can people get in touch with you if they're going through some of these determinations themselves or just want to learn a little bit more about what their options are regarding ISO? Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll like put my put our phone number out on here and everything like that. Yeah, if you want to, it's your call. Okay, sounds good. Now, well, first check out on our website. We have sections on that. So on our website, you can take a look at our management systems section on that. Our website is www.bcaconsultants.com. On there, you can sign up for our newsletter too. I try to do about a quarterly newsletter on various items. I always try to cover an environmental topic, a management system topic and health and safety topics. So there's kind of ongoing information there. Um, anyone can call our office up in South Bend. It's mm-hmm. 574-522-1019. Uh, my email is on our website as well as you contact us. So website, phone call, um, easy ways to kind of get in touch with that. I see all that stuff coming through on the email. If you, um, if anyone uh, either signs up for the newsletter or does a inquiry through our contact us part of our website i'll see that and and can contact anyone awesome all right tony well it's been amazing having you on we appreciate you being a guest on end camps uh campfire sessions so do you have any kind of final parting words uh that you'd like to get out there for the people i do not um other than it's always good to get yourself organized when it comes to environmental issues they can creep up um, you may think everything's running okay and then something happens and an inspector shows up or something happens and now you have an yeah. issue on your hands. So environmental is something that is always in the background and may not be in the forefront as similar as quality and health and safety where it's in your face on what mm-hmm. the problems are, what the problems could be. So take some digging. So that's what I'd ask. Get awesome. organized. Just kind of make sure you're planning for the future on what could happen for yourself too. Definitely. I agree with that. Well, thank you, Tony. And then uh, actually just to throw kind of one one final, you know, interesting topic that's, you know, currently going on. So how do you think COVID-19 and coronavirus in general is going to like impact inspections, kind of this whole process? You know, I, we're both, uh, you know, hopping on yeah. a call with each other from our homes. How do you think that's yeah. going to, you know, affect the next 12 months for people in EHS? I'm glad you asked that because I meant to actually touch on that earlier um, when we were talking a little bit more about the standard specifics. So tying it back to the 14,001 stuff, there's a whole section called internal and external issues, managing for change. I would go through with companies and, and set stuff up and we would talk about this section called internal and external issues. And not once have I gone through the external issues section, and this is what it is. And it's like, oh, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. An external issue, a pandemic. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now it's forcing, you know, management to maybe 
stay on site or maybe working from home. Operations are down. Some operations are still up. But how are you going? To, how are you monitoring your environmental? Whether you have to track things daily or you have to track things monthly or weekly, you have to do certain weekly inspections. Mm-hmm. Item is not necessarily in the EPA is not necessarily said they're going to um, push back any deadlines. If you have a report due on April fifteenth, it was due on April fifteenth. If you have a, due, a report due on July one, it's due July one. So mm-hmm. I'm going to look at this differently now. That what's an external issue? Maybe it's a pandemic. Maybe it's something else that. It forces people to work from home and maybe you're still operating a little bit and you still have reports due. So how are we going to gather this information to put the report together that's due when we're all from home? But maybe that machine or that process is still operating on a skeleton crew. But that skeleton crew doesn't include the person that normally was gathering that data and taking it to the office but that person is no longer in the office. So looking at it from that standpoint, it's a, it's something I'm going to rethink on how I kind of look at in external, internal issues from the standard. Um, mm-hmm. Looking kind of theoretically at the future, kind of what do I think is going to happen? Um, I think it's going to change. I think it could change things from health and safety regulation, regulation side of things. Mm-hmm. I won't be surprised if we have some sort of, sanitation standard that OSHA inspectors could be looking at. Do you have to have, I don't know, hand sanitizer in certain places now? Or if you have a break room, do you have to make sure that everyone eating lunch during break time in the break room are three feet apart or something? Are there going to be, maybe that's a little excessive, but are there going to be standards that now come out 12 months down the road? Because we've gone through this and now we look at, how can we control this better? And how we control things is typically through rules and regulations and legislation and things like that. So I think something's going to happen. Definitely on the health and safety side. I don't know if much will change environmental regulatory mm-hmm. side. I am an EPA have kind of been going as normal. Yeah. With, For sure. With with some lacks on the enforcement and, and kind of inspection side of things. Yeah. Well, Tony, tell you what, I'd love to, uh, you know, have you back on for another session, maybe in six months and you can give us, you know, your update on what you're seeing as this continues to, you know, unfold and you keep working with, with new clients through this, uh, you know, kind of unprecedented pandemic that we're in. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting times for everybody, <laughs> all industries, Definitely. every industry, it's like touching Everyone. in different ways and it's, it's crazy. Yeah. hundred percent. All right, Tony, well, we're at our time. So I just want to say thank you for coming on. Uh, For all of you listening, this has been Tony DeMarco uh, from BCA. They're a full service environmental consulting firm based in the Midwest. They've got regional offices in several different states. Uh, I'm Luke Jacobs, your host from NCAMP. And this has been a campfire session. We're signing off. Thanks.